USA versus Dustin Jacob McFetridge. Please note that we have made every attempt to reproduce the transcript as it actually is. You may notice some sections sound like we have forgotten our lines, or we are stumbling on our words. The transcript itself reads this way. For example, it is the actual treatment work that we have a, a kind of guide of tasks that we want clients to engage in, to explore initially how they became a person who could offend, and, the, and, the, and then from there, it's simply a process of digging deeper into those issues so that they know how to create the best relapse prevention plan possible for themselves. With that out of the way, I hope you enjoy this look into the courtroom proceedings. All right, Mr. Taylor. Ms. Pierce, you may cross-examine. And good morning. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm not sure. It's a little bit closer to the afternoon, but I'm going to start with where you left off, if that's okay. Okay. Going forward, you had mentioned that CCS would welcome him back. And you, in fact, spoke to Mr. McFetridge this morning, and you told him that. Is that right? I don't know that I told him that, but... Did you mention that you hope to see him back in counseling sessions? I think I said something along those lines, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. And one thing that you mentioned is there's also additional things that can be added to your program to include individual counseling. Is that something fair to say as well? We have that in, in some rare instances. We do have that. Now, that's... That's something that we also have to clear up with the referral agency because, you know, those are all cost services. So if the referral agency is, is willing to go along with that, in this case, it's probation. If they are, if they have the funds available for that. If they have the resources. Yes. And in some situations to help those individuals who are having problems expressing themselves. Some of the things that Mr. McFetridge noted in his summary to you that he was having problems with, they could address some of those issues on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Is that fair to say also? Yes. Now, we don't, we don't, we never look at individual treatment as the primary mode of treatment, though. <laughs> Correct. And what I have in mind. Do you know a counselor by the name of Teresa Fletcher? Yes. <laughs> okay. Very good. A very good counselor? Yes. And is often used by the probation office, that that is a potential that could be added on to the CCS services. Is that fair to say as well? Yes. And one thing that you mentioned is that Mr. McFetridge, you know, all the way down to the point where the petition was filed, has expressed to you and the rest of the staff that he is wanting to participate in treatment. Is that fair also? He made those statements repeatedly throughout the course of his treatment. I think the thing is, is that never really appeared to be. He, making the statements and actually, actually demonstrated that there were two different things. And you mentioned something that you thought had changed is his support system. And you see those individuals here today. Is that? Yes. And are you familiar with who those individuals are? Some of them. Uh, okay. And one of those females is someone who actually came to that meeting with Mr. McFetridge. Yes. Is that right, Ms. Betty? Yes. Is that how you refer to her as well? Yes. And how did she describe to you how she came in contact with Dustin and her contact with him over the years? I'm sorry, I, I don't recall how she described that. Okay, okay. Uh, did she tell you that she's a member of a church that other church people go to meet with Dustin at his home? No, I do recall there was that association. I do recall we talked about that in the session. That it was a faith-based connection? Mm hmm Yes. And that he was continuing on that path with them. Is that, is that right? Yes. And she's here today. Is that right as well? Yes. Do you recall... Because you had mentioned that you had scheduled a family session with his mother and a support person, which was Miss Betty. Was that not just within the same month of him being discharged from the program? It was. 
<laughs> okay. And that, that, that session you refer to as being very productive. Is that right? The results of that, I think, revealed Dustin's willingness to create those. The documents that he did was, and unfortunately, by the time that we had gotten to that place, you know, and all the things that he talked about in those documents. And I have to say that even with those documents, there's, there's the noted contradiction of I'm doing well, but I need help. But from your perspective, you saw that as being productive. At least something, yes. And I, I guess I want to go back. The decision to terminate him from CCS, was that made by you or was that made by the probation office in light of the petition that was filed? No, that was, this is, it's always a cooperative thing. You know, we, we work together with probation and we're looking at the whole of the circumstance with a client. Okay. And the written documents that you provided, I mean, like you mentioned, there's some good with the bad, I guess, from your perspective. I mean, both from the defense perspective, there's some also deep sharing within those documents. Is there not? There is. And, and I, as I said earlier, I could not recall. It seems like one of those documents he provided me in the next group session and one of them after he was after he was discharged. At least that's the way I recall that that occurred, that he came up there. Or, well, was one of them brought whenever you had the session with his family? No, 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 no. We were, I had asked him in that session to prepare the document. Okay. And do you recall that also during that session, you had told him that you would, you know, be working with him, that you wanted to see what he could do within the next six months, that, that that's what the family would have walked away understanding that, you know, that it was a productive session as well. Yeah. I Now, back up for just a moment, because I don't recall saying anything about the over the course of the next six months. Now, I may have expressed that I was hopeful for something of that nature. But again, when we are talking about you know, our organization, we make these decisions collectively as a treatment team, and everybody is going to weigh in on a different perspective. And ultimately, where we land as a whole, we're all in support. We stand behind our decision, our collective decision. And I understand that you came in on the tail end of this, I, I guess is the best way to describe it, uh, in March of 2018? Yes, that gave me approximately one year with him. Or a little bit less, I think. I think he was discharged in January or February. Yeah, February. The documents that I've been provided as treatment notes from CCS, if I could pass those to you, and if you could identify them as records from the facility... Because I would assume that you would have reviewed these documents prior to taking on Mr. McFetchage in your counseling sessions. Mm -hmm. Yes, Th these are our monthly summaries. And if, Your Honor, I'd like to introduce those as the next exhibit. That will be number three. Yes, Your Honor. And under seal also, Your Honor. Under seal. Do you want him to refer to them? I'm sorry? Do you want the witness to have... I don't know that necessarily he needs to. If the court would like to be looking at some of those, because I think that that, I guess, would that be reflective of his treatment up until the point, I guess, that you took over? And then some of your reports are included as well? It could be. Or in the case sometimes of co-facilitation, it's one or the other that is responsible for completing the monthly summaries. And just so that I'm clear... You would not have been at CCS whenever he started the treatment in 2016, uh, mm, uh, 2015, uh, sorry, January of 2015. Is that correct? No, I was not there at that time. So you just came back to CCS in March of 2018. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. So at the point that you took over his treatment, and I guess you were just his teen treatment counselor, is that a better way to place, or were you the director over the whole program? No, I'm just one of the clinicians. Okay. I don't want to downgrade or, or upgrade. No, you're fine. Or anything of that nature. But you would have been responsible for his sessions, as well as probably some other teams. Is that right? Some other, yeah, yes, yes. Because you indicated that there was approximately 100, mm, and how many patients there? 
160, 170 total. Okay. And so you indicated that those individuals, uh, and you said no more than 10 in a group? That's correct. Those individuals are not able to present at one time. Is that they are not able to present in the hour and a half? I mean, you're not able to take all 10 of them and let them all speak during one session? No. Okay. It's actually probably difficult. Uh, I think you mentioned there were maybe one or two that you'd be able to focus on at one time. Is that fair to say also? Right. Yes, yes. But regardless, everyone is getting something out of that group session. That's the hope. Okay, so... That everybody is contributing. Everybody is benefiting from what's from what we're processing. And so if you do have an individual who does have some individual issues in sharing, even though they're not presenting, they still may be internalizing what they're hearing. Is that fair to say also? Yes. And in many cases, somebody who is... Somebody whose issue is significant and relates to one of the of, of their dynamic risk factors that is relevant to their offense process, then we can we can call that a presentation, and we, we do call that a presentation. They're working on something substantial for themselves. And even getting to that point in the I guess the the team meetings, they've actually had to go through a first phase, is that right? The learning phase where they're educated and that sort of thing? Yes, we now we don't do this as much as we used to, but at that time we had what was called the psychoeducational group. And from what you're indicating that your experience in Virginia has been, that in the three years that he had been in this program, at least in Virginia, they would have progressed to the point where they would have either graduated or there would not be any more services being provided. Is that fair to say? I'm not sure I'm understanding your question. I guess whenever you referenced that you were connected in Virginia, that most of the offenders there are only in the program for approximately three years. Is that due to funding issues? Or is that because that program is that much better than CCS? No, it's just, it's a different way of, that that Virginia has of structuring that is something that the Department of Corrections there has in place that unless there are some unique circumstances that individuals are not to remain. So consequently, we have a client that can complete treatment and receive a certificate, or they could be essentially discharged from treatment as having met maximum benefit, which was just essentially we did the best we could in the time we had. All right. And so would it be a funding issue in that situation? Yes. And most of the offenders, I guess, that you were dealing with there at CCS are federal offenders. Is that fair to say also? No, no. Okay. I stand corrected. Actually, most of them are state. Okay. The, the, uh, it, it appears from the records that I have passed to the court that he completed the treatment readiness and was transitioned into the sex offender pattern cycle, Uh, January 28th, 2016. Does that sound about right? Yes. So by the time that he got to that point, he would have already completed a full disclosure polygraph. Is that fair to say? I'm not certain. It's not, it doesn't always happen that they would complete a full disclosure before entering the process. I'd have to look back to see that, but... And if the records show that, I guess you're... I'm good with that, yeah. And so he he would also have completed the plethysmograph. Is that fair to say also? And there would have been a level of honesty that goes along with that as well. Well, again, those could take place. Those don't necessarily have to happen in that psychoeducational phase. But once again, if the records show that he completed that uh, May of 2015... Yeah. Some offenders who come to the program don't complete those phases, correct? They're not willing to disclose fully their prior sexual acting out. Yes, yes. And it, it appears that he did follow through and had maintenance polygraphs following that in 2017. Is that, um, I guess, 2016 and 2017, he would have been continuing to comply with the treatment program during those, those time frames as well. 
I'm going to assume so. I don't have those records in front of me right here, so Okay. I don't have any I don't have any reason to doubt what you're saying that you've made notes of those. Would you agree with me that probably one of the hardest phases for offenders to go through is the sexual offense? Their pattern, their cycle, addressing what has happened. Again, that's that's calling for a conclusion that they're all the same. And different different guys are going to struggle in different aspects of their treatment. Some are going to be able to handle that much better than others. And so sometimes it's sometimes it can be just the the denial of I of I have offended that we can that we can spend they end up kind of struggling to work through. And Mr. McFetridge did not do that. He did not. He also acknowledged self-trauma himself. He did. Okay. And even though, you know, that may be something that is difficult for them to understand, but they have to understand if they have been victimized. They need to process that also in the process of receiving treatment. Do they not? They do. And it gives us an opportunity to really look at, in some cases, we have to explore the effect of trauma the effect on them? Do they need additional services as well related to their own victimization? And also it gives us an opportunity to really begin to look at what ideas that this helped them form about sex and contact that is that, that is unhealthy for them. And one thing that you mentioned that is very helpful for them is a support system, sometimes beyond their family. Yes. And individuals who come there for counseling sessions, many of them go to church, do they not? Again, I, I don't know if I could say many of them. A lot of them do. They attend church services. Okay. And that sometimes can be an accountability partner. It can be, yes. And it can also be a support system for that individual. Is that fair to say also? Yes. And some of the things that you mentioned that he was having difficulty in discussing and engaging in, some of those things, it's normal for you to have to work through with those offenders. Is that fair to say as well? It is not unusual to have to, to encounter those with individuals. It is, it is unusual that we would spend two years doing so. If we haven't found strategies that have assisted an individual within that time frame, if if that client is not discovering strategies for themselves to overcome that, then... And again, you were not spending years with him. You had just started in March. Is that right? That is that is true. But I have the confidence in my colleagues that they were making those efforts. Okay. And if I could, I'm going to go through... Uh, it looks like whenever there's a reference to progress towards towards goals and objectives... It looks like from January 31st, 2016, there was a reference of it being excellent and also moderate participation and also, I think, moderate risk of reoffending. So going forward, it looks like in the months that he did not present in March of 2016, progress towards goals were average. Continuing on. I'm just going to object at this point because I'm not sure what Mrs. Pierce's question is or how the witness is supposed to answer from a huge volume of records what is actually being asked here. What is your question? Your Honor, and I assume that you've looked through the reports? I have seen the reports. And the only month that there was any question about, you know, him being, there being any concerns was the month that, that he had surgery in 2017. Otherwise, everything that's reflected in these monthly summaries reflect an individual who is participating in treatment, who is attending, and who is, you know, was not able to present, but was ready and willing to present. I mean, because you've reviewed the end reports also, correct? I have. I don't, I'm not sure that I understand your conclusion, though. Well, for example, in August of 2016... Dustin made progress regarding his sexual offense dynamics this month. Dustin presented on his sexual history. We'll explore further. Does that not indicate an individual who is participating? It is. And of course, you weren't there. I mean, part of the problem. I know, but it is It is not unusual. And there are those times that we've seen those avoidant clients. And this is something that Dustin has acknowledged. He is an avoidant client. 
And yet we have seen those, those, I've seen those clients throughout my career that will have that spike in presentation and engagement only to return back to a, to that kind of status quo state. Okay. And I guess Amy Mize, she's the director. Is that right? She is the clinical director. Yes. And even in November, she references that he's exploring his sexual history, making excellent progress for November. Okay. And he may have at that time, I, that's what I'm saying. He may have at that point, but subsequently a return to the status quo. And then later in March of 2017, I believe mm, uh, Chris Gregg mentions that he's making significant progress regarding his sexual offense dynamics. Okay, what I'm hearing is a pattern that sounded like August, November, March. We're talking about, you know, three times so far that I've heard that. And again, that's that's not unusual with certain clients that they will increase their participation and for whatever reason. But the problem is, is that the return to the status quo occurs. And that's what we're trying to not have happen. If we can keep an individual that's if we can capture that level of treatment, engagement, and capitalize on that and keep that going, then we've got an individual that we can be successful with. But you would agree that, that these would summarize his treatment progress. I mean, because that's what these are called, federal monthly summaries. Objection, Your Honor. They summarize a point in November. They summarize a point in March. And I get that. And I don't disagree with you that there were those points. But the points are indicative of only reference in time that too much space between. Okay. And I guess, can you point to any of the summaries where there were, or there was issues pointed out? The, if they, if they weren't included in there, I can, I can assure you that they were in, in group counseling and in communicating with, with Dustin, as I previously stated. I could not sit here and pick out particular note, but I don't have them in front of me, but, uh. And concerns should be noted in those. And I guess the records would speak for themselves for the court to look at as well. But any of the issues that arose, would it be fair to say, came only after the failed polygraph in June and July of 2018, and then later? No. In November or January of 2019? No. Was there also discussions that you learned, I guess, during your treatment with with Mr. McFetridge? that he had had a fall in 2017, in uh, July of 2017. I know that he did have a fall. I'm vague right now on when on when that occurred. And that he, I guess, explained to you that there was, that he was, he fell on a table and was unconscious for a period of time. I'm sorry, I don't recall the exact, all of the circumstances about that at this point. It sounds, I mean, I'm not disputing you. I don't recall all of the circumstances that surrounded that. Okay. But he has, I guess, uh, brought that up. And during some of the counseling sessions that there have been some medical concerns that he's had since this fall. Is that fair to say? I wasn't aware of that. So you're not aware of any MRIS or anything of that nature that have been conducted? No. Uh, That's fine. Last, just a couple of other things. I guess, did did your discussions with the probation office continue after Mr. McVetridge has been released from the program in, in terms of looking at the potential of putting him back into the program? There was. There was on a few occasions. There were conversation. And you may or may not be aware of this. Are you aware that probation went out to conduct a search at Mr. McVetridge's home? I mean, that's something that they routinely do. Do you... Are you aware that, you know... Items were seized? I don't know. Did that happen after his discharge from treatment? So you're saying you don't know anything about that? If you don't know anything about that, I don't want to ask you. I don't know which time you're referring to. It happened. I mean, probation does that routinely. So are you... I wasn't sure if you're referring to a time when he was in treatment or since then. Either while he was in treatment or... Okay. I knew of one that did occur while he was in treatment. I thought you were referring to one that occurred maybe after. So while he was in treatment, I guess, the discoveries of those searches, nothing was found that was of concern to either the probation office or your office. Is that fair to say also? No, no, not necessarily. I mean... Oh, okay. There was no pornography found. There was 
Okay. Nothing of concern for the probation. Okay. For you or him being in the program. Is that... Well, again, when you speak to... When you're speaking about concern, you know, certainly if they had found pornography, that would be problematic. Right. Okay. But concern speaks to more... Again, thinking about what is... What is found, one of the things that I'm aware of that was discovered that is concern for me is the fact that, you know, game systems and so forth, as Dustin has acknowledged his his adolescent mindset. And my concern about that for him is is that it's, you know, these things provide the opportunity. He's his tendency to be isolated and therefore his tendency would be to rely on gaming systems as a primary a primary way of entertainment that's that's still a concern for me for him that and that's something that i guess during treatment you address and that sort of thing as well yes absolutely okay all right but but nothing of concern that would make him someone that you would not want to be put back in the program i guess that's the point i'm trying to make yeah i, I don't know that there was anything discovered that was that was problematic and nothing was that I was made aware of. All right. And you mentioned that the failed polygraphs, that you don't make the assumption that he's done anything wrong, that you instead look at it as treatment issues, that there may be a slippery slope or or something that may be on or or something of that nature. Sure. So it's a it's an opportunity to start addressing more of the meat of the issues in treatment. Yes. Is that fair to say also? That's fair to say, yes. Because you would agree that a failed polygraph could also be attributable to health issues as well. No, I'm not I'm not able to speak to that, but I'm just thinking of the you know, what we know is that, you know, sometimes we have had clients who have similarly imagined pornography and reflected upon their own history of that and used it for masturbatory purposes. Then when you when they are asked a question, are you using pornography, you know, they say no because but then it's a tangle for them, and they don't always end up passing that test. So, again, kind of thinking of the slippery slope that you mentioned. Right. Right. So, And so a failed polygraph is not a basis to remove somebody from the program. No, not necessarily. Not in and of itself. And because there, there's many explanations, as even you indicated, you know, them visualizing things in their head could yeah. impact the results of that, that test. Yeah, and it's going to be taken in a whole. As we look at the whole client picture, you know, we're going to we're going to look like in Dustin's case where, you know, it was like the three in a row and the, the continual kind of avoidance of exploring that. It's more about the avoidance of exploring that to me. And is that something that can be addressed once again in treatment? Potentially, potentially. That's really going to depend on Dustin. And I guess I want to end back up where I started. Do you have other individuals who are in individual counseling in addition to treatment with CCS? We have. We have, we have, we have a very limited number of opportunities for that. I'm trying to think. I'm not currently serving any clients individually myself, but there's sometimes when we do that, we have to do it only for kind of a short duration to specifically address a relevant issue with a client. We don't have the resources to really continue. Okay. And you just said something that, uh, so you yourself have individually counseled somebody that's also in group counseling. Is that fair to say? Historically, I have. But again, my with the schedule that I have, it it's, you know... It has to be carefully constructed and limited. We don't have we don't have the ability to do that on a long term basis. And let me say that again: the research has demonstrated, and this group treatment is the proper modality. And research has proven that to be the best modality for treatment. And I guess sometimes, if you're going to have individual counseling, it may be better to have someone outside of the group session to conduct that. Would that be fair to say as well? Not necessarily. Okay. It could be. Again, it's just you have to look at the individual client dynamics about that. And in this situation, I mean, just, you know, mentioning Ms. Fletcher, would that be someone that your office could work with? Absolutely. We've worked with Ms. Fletcher many times in the past, and we have utmost respect for her ability. Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. And I believe that's all. All right. 
redirect, Mr. Taylor? Thank you to the folks that have joined the Patreon. We continue to grow and it's just awesome. Special thanks to Dummy Data, Kelp Pill, Tech Rec 71, Cat G, Westmost, Michael's TCAP Channel, M1A, Ramiro San, TCAP Recipes, Graham Graham, Aero Doe, Dr. K, Amanda James, Tiffany Lockhart, Joey's TCAP Channel, Michelle Simpson, Uriel Gray, Moody Booty, The Lorne Identity, Nathan Ramon, Rhoda's Chewed Tootsie, I'm Just Being Honest, Saul, Claudette, Many Syllables, Patrick TCAP Ireland, and the glue that holds this all together, Gooey Who. Thank you immensely to everyone who watches and comments. I appreciate you all so much. See you next time. Bye.